In the early 1970s, Jack Kirby made a much ballyhooed switch from Marvel Comics to DC Comics and began pitching a mega sprawling story that drew upon the idea of humanity's shared monomyth along with blending in the ideas of the pseudo-historical philosophy of Eric von Däniken. Kirby would introduce readers to the twin planets of New Genesis and Apocalypse, who had once been the same world called Urgrunt, only to be literally torn apart by a war between the forces of High Father of New Genesis and Dark Side of Apocalypse. Even after the split, fighting continued until a ceasefire was arranged involving the two rulers exchanging newborn children, with Dark Side's son Orion moving to New Genesis and High Father's son Scott Free moving to Apocalypse. Of course, that didn't necessarily mean the fighting was over, it would just kind of move into the background, like, say, to other planets, like Earth, for example. Finally, a group of young people from New Genesis would relocate to Earth in order to defend the world from possible incursions from Apocalypse. This group, called the Forever People, would basically act a lot like a hippie commune. Because, you know, nothing bad ever really came out of hippie communes, like the Manson family, or Jonestown, or... The TV show Mixed-ish. Despite not exactly meeting sales expectations, mainly due to the fact that DC overprinted the supply, coupled with a massive blizzard striking the northeastern United States, Kirby's New Gods stories would endure and shape the DC Universe for decades to come. We're, um... We're not really covering the Jack Kirby New Gods today. Instead, we're actually covering the DC New 52 New Gods, and uh, there are some differences which we'll get into a little bit later. On the plus side, one of the creative voices behind this project was the late Keith Giffen, who was a Kirby disciple who helped revitalize the New Gods with his classic Legion of Superheroes storyline, The Great Darkness Saga. Then again, this is also the New 52 we're talking about, so... From 2014, this is Infinity Man and the Forever People. After oversleeping, Serafina rushes through the floating capital of New Genesis, attempting to locate a departure station. Her classmates Moonrider and Dreamer are already waiting there, and the trio is going to be further delayed as the mother box they need in order to teleport to Earth won't seem to start up for some reason. The group then gets interrupted by the arrival of Serafina's brother Viking and his girlfriend Azorte. Viking and Moonrider immediately get into an argument as it turns out that Moonrider, Dreamer, and Serafina are effectively draft dodging due to the fact that Moonrider believes the High Father is just as controlling and despotic as Darkseid, while Viking believes in towing the line. However, in the process of hammering home his thesis, Viking inadvertently strikes some other box and activates it. This coincides with the rival of the group's professor, Hyman, who arrives and points out that if Viken does not go through the opening boom tube, anyone who does go through will not be able to return to New Genesis. We'll get into the lineup's power set and personalities a little bit later. For now, we need to talk about Mother Boxes, the teleportation devices used for people from New Genesis and Apocalypse to boss around through the cosmos. Now, the boxes open up portals called boom tubes that allow for almost instantaneous travel to a pre-programmed location. The rub being that only the one who activates the mother box and programs the destination can actually use it to get back to where they came from. Meaning that Viking now has to travel with this group that he apparently does not like. Azorte informs her boyfriend that she's staying behind as the others begin going through the portal. Reluctantly, Viking must go after them. As the group travels through the tube, never having done so before, they get a little discombobulated as they lie on Earth and begin falling into piles of garbage. Serafina is the only lucky one as she just gets thrown through a plate glass window where she is greeted by their host named Big Bear. Big Bear explains that the group is in Venice Beach, California and will be working out of a headquarters camouflaged as an apartment complex with a swimming pool. This is all thanks to the group's supercomputer known as Kirby. Though Hymon is still technically in charge of the mission, he's never really around, only contacting the group via holographic telephone. To that end, this group must now get to work preparing Earth to eventually be included in the war. However, their early work is interrupted by a distress call from a Saharan desert farming center in the Sudan. Yes, they're turning the Sahara Desert into farmhand because, you know, who needs ecosystems, am I right? Anyway, the farmers are being attacked and slowly mutated into monstrous bug creatures by a being called Mantis, and no, it's not the one you're thinking about, although I'm pretty sure you've all seen that comic trick video explaining how that character is somehow simultaneously a Marvel and DC character, but no, that has nothing to do with this story. 
The team arrive, and Big Bear begins looking for the operations manager, Omar Bashir, before they get jumped by bug-like creatures. It's then that Big Bear begins to look like his namesake as he begins taking out the creatures and tossing them aside. As Mantis arrives with reinforcements, the mother box begins to glow and transform. Each of the team members begins hearing a voice calling them to place their hand on the box and hear out a certain name. A name they then call out as soon as they touch it. Taru. A massive explosion goes off and Mantis soon finds himself standing in the presence of a being called the Infinity Man. He's willing to help Mantis, but the team is actually tossed into a barn where a group of viewing screens suddenly manage to repair themselves in order for them to witness the actions. The Infinity Man explains that he's not a part of New Genesis or Apocalypse and wishes to start a third front, but if anything is going to work, this group must learn to reason with Mantis and try to find a peaceful way to solve this. Unfortunately, Dreamer is really the only team member who wishes to reason with Mantis as everyone else tries to fight the creature. Eventually, Mantis reveals that he is actually a mutated Omar Bashir and that somehow the new Genesis technology got infected with some type of virus from Apocalypse that transformed all of these scientists. Dreamer collapses as Mantis flies away, leading the team to decide to tend to her needs instead of his. Inside Dreamer's mind, she gets confronted by someone or something that's trying to get her to use it for some sort of power reason. Okay, there's an aspect of Dreamer which we'll get into a little bit later. Just for now, know that her powers basically involve dreaming psychic visions of the future. Okay, so let's get to the rest of the power set here. Big Bear is, well, obviously big and strong with the ability to shapeshift into a bear that he didn't have in the original Kirby comics. Then there's Serafina, who was Seraphin in those original Kirby comics, but has been uh, gender swapped here. However, she still has the power to basically psychically create these cartridges that she can use to help evolve people into their next state of being with all the problems that that can entail. Then there's Viking, who can uh, manipulate magnetic blasts and just power people that way. Finally, there's Moonrider, who has the Megaton Touch that can basically just cause giant explosions to anything he comes in forcible contact with. Now, combined, they all form the Infinity Man, whose powers and backstory we'll get into a little bit later. Back on New Genesis, Hyman receives news of the Infinity Man's arrival and elects to dispatch Azerte to Earth despite her protests. Okay, I should point out we're going to be skipping an issue here, as it's actually a tie-in issue to a weekly Batman-based event DC ran at the time called Future's End that saw Terry McGinnis, a.k.a. Batman Beyond, basically brought into the mainstream DC Universe. There isn't too much to really go into here, it's just that all the Forever People, say for Dreamer and Moonrider to a lesser extent, are dead. The Boom Tube malfunctions and drops the team off in Ventura, California, just outside of Wayne Enterprise's Agricultural Dairy Research Facility. Viking attempts to reactivate the mother box, only for a cow to confuse it with a salt lick. Big Bear suggests just taking the bus home instead, as Serafina bonds with the cow-clad bovine, who seemingly then turns down an offer to join the group. Yes, this is indeed Bat Cow, a cow who had been infected with several viruses by a group of criminals in order to taint the milk, who eventually got adopted by Batman and Robin. Back on New Genesis, Hyman discusses events with Highfather, though he lies about the group's effectiveness and why they need to stay on Earth, only to be interrupted by the Infinity Man warning the Professor to stay out of his business and let him help those who need it. Back on Earth, Azorte greets the group as they return home and agrees to try to integrate into the community. Somehow this winds up leading into another confrontation between Moonrider and Viking, which is halted by Serafina. While everyone steps away to cool down for a little bit, Serafina notices a pool cleaner by the name of Dr. Scuba getting harassed by some alpha bro douchebag guys. Upon hearing Scuba talk about the importance of having to maintain the purity of water, it causes Serafina to decide to actually try to boost his evolutionary skills by embedding one of her psychic power enhancement cartridges into the back of his head. However, when Serafina begins heading back to the apartment complex, some passersby note that it was odd that she was so kind to someone who's listed as a repeat offender. Yo... However, the uneasy piece does not really last long as it's interrupted by a large explosion in the sky and the ensuing arrival of Guy Gardner, the Red Lantern. Red Lanterns are beings fueled by all-encompassing pure blind rage with the ability to channel blood magic through their power rings. 
Guy Gardner became a Red Lantern upon seeing the apparent death of Kyle Rayner. Later, Rayner was able to revive and actually became a Blue Lantern of Hope. He then purified Guy Gardner's ring, which allows him better control over his anger, which has gained him something of a higher standing with the Red Lantern Corps. It turns out that tensions have been rising between High Father and the various Lantern Corps, and Guy wants the Forever People off of Earth. Unfortunately, Guy's bombastic arrival has damaged Kirby, leading Big Bear to begin fighting with the Red Lantern. Viking immediately joins in with Big Bear, however, Moonrider decides to try to sit things out, much to everyone else's chagrin, as he believes that Gardner is right about High Father. It's only after everyone begins guilt-tripping him that Moonrider decides to reinsert himself. However, it turns out that Guy did not arrive alone, as Green Lantern Corps members Chip and Green Man have arrived to provide backup for him. As this happens, the Mother Box begins to activate again, calling for the members to place their hands on it and call out Taru to summon the Infinity Man once more. The Lanterns respond by basically forming a giant dark side construct, with the Infinity Man matching it in size, leading to a giant holographic kaiju battle in the middle of downtown Los Angeles. Eventually, though, the Infinity Man blasts the Lanterns into a nearby skyscraper and puts them all to sleep, before then helping a man named Ken Faraday get to the hospital. King Faraday is a master spy of the DC Universe dating back to the 1960s, so yeah, he's pretty much Nick Fury, although he technically predates Nick Fury. However, nowadays he's specializing in a government organization meant to track alien and other dimensional beings working on planet Earth. After everyone has seemingly recovered, Chip decides that it's okay for the Forever People to stay on Earth, as it turns out that they really have no memory of whenever they summon the Infinity Man. That being said, he decides to warn the group to not trust the Infinity Man, as he may possibly be more powerful than either High Father or Darkseid. Of course, it turns out that the Forever People were lying to Chip about whether or not they remember the Infinity Man. Really, though, they just did this to try to buy some time, as they now are beginning to feel the need that they will probably have to kill High Father. On New Year's Eve, all the recent events have put a real strain on Mood Rider, and he's not exactly in a partying mood, as Serafina soon emerges from the ocean. It turns out that earlier she paid a visit to Dr. Scuba, only to find out that he was using his newfound abilities to capture and torture the people who were harassing him earlier. In fact, he can actually manipulate the ocean water to imprison these people and basically slowly drown them to death. When she objected to his actions, he swept her away with a sudden flash flood. The two would battle out into the ocean until Serafina managed to get Scuba into a position where she could remove the power cartridge from the back of his head. And then she left him to drown. Our heroes, ladies and gentlemen. As for Moonrider, Big Bear had basically held a little lecture to explain what exactly was happening with New Year's. It confused the group as they were feeling like no time passage had actually taken place. However, Viken and Azerte really seemed to be up for the idea of kissing your partner at midnight. That being said, when Dreamer made the same proposition to Moonrider, he suddenly started to flip out a little bit, and thus left the group to try to go get some air. Basically, Moonrider acknowledges that he and Dreamer do have romantic feelings for each other. However, following through on said feelings would just complicate matters and really jeopardize the mission, so he knows he really can't do that. Serafina reminds Moonrider that a new year just means a reset before kissing him and heading back to the party. It seems she's not the only one interested in Moonrider, as soon a young woman named Lilani, who had been flirting with him earlier, arrives to try to put the moves on him once again. That is, until Elani slips up and mentions New Genesis and soon reveals that she's actually part of a group called the Femme Fatales from Apocalypse. It's then another boom tube opens up, bringing in three other Fatales, Thumper, Enchantrix, and Kill Sandra. Moonrider tries to fight them off, but Enchantrix winds up poisoning him, and the only way they're going to be able to fix him is if he turns over Dreamer into their possession. Okay, so this is where we're getting into the New 52 backstory of Isaiah, a.k.a. Highfather, his brother Uxus, a.k.a. Darkseid, and their father, Yuga Khan. The progeny set about rebelling to start a new world by killing their fellow gods. Yuga Khan fought back by utilizing his ultimate weapon, the Anti-Life Equation, to resurrect the gods and control them. Eventually, Isaiah and Uxus won, but disagreed over the use of the Anti-Life Equation. Uxus wished to use it to ensure that they couldn't be overthrown like they had just overthrown Yuka Khan. The Anti-Life Equation is a mathematical formula that gives one the ability to control life and death by controlling all free will. After all, if one can't choose to rebel, they're not going to rebel. 
Now, High Father took the equation and basically placed it inside of Dreamer in order to hide it from Darkseid. This is why the group is now on Earth. In a fun little twist, however, the Femme Fatales are not actually part of Darkseid forces. Rather, they're actually a group from Apocalypse that is a cult trying to resurrect Yuga Khan via the Anti-Life Equation. Anyway, now back to the story. Dreamer is able to sense that Moonrider is in danger, and Viking uses the Mother Box to pinpoint his location. As they prepare to help Moonrider out, a portal to Apocalypse opens, and Agog begins trying to tempt Moonrider into turning over Dreamer. Agog points out that he, much like Mark, wishes to also take out the gods, as he feels their rule is unjust. However, Moonrider does not want the return of Yuga Khan either, and refuses, leading Agog to kill him just as the team arrives. Dreamer rushes to Moonrider's side as the others begin fighting with the Femme Fatales, knowing that she only has one option. She begins reciting the Anti-Life Equation to resurrect Moonrider. As Moonrider revives, Agog decides to call off his forces and closes the portal, stranding them on Earth. Still using the Anti-Life Equation, Dreamer takes over the minds of the Femme Fatales and sends them back to Apocalypse. However, she doesn't send them to Agog, she sends them to the Dark Side, where they will now become the new elite fighting forces for none other than... Sorry, I gotta do the Linkara reference. Great goodness! The group returns to their headquarters and Moonrider is laid to rest, though no one knows exactly what will be there when he wakes up. It's then that Big Bear receives a message from the Infinity Man who has a story of his own to tell. The Infinity Man explains that this goes back to the follow-up of the war against Yuga Khan. With Isaiah and Uxus constantly fighting each other and the planet Ugar being split apart, literally, Darkseid began launching several massive attacks against High Father. Isaiah turned to his chief advisor, Hyman, to try to figure out what was going on and how to fix it. This wasn't the first attack, but it probably needed to be the last. Hyman explained there was really only one choice, as it had been dictated to them by none other than the Source. The source is believed to be the guiding conscience that constructed the DC Universe, thus creating individuals with superpowers like Superman, or the Lantern Corps, or Starfire, or others like the New Gods. However, the source is actually protected by a large wall that itself is watched over by a chairbound being named Metron, and very rarely have individuals gone by the source wall into the source to deal with it. There was only one solution delivered by the source. The exchanging of sons between Isaiah and Uxus. However, High Father literally traveled to the source trying to find some other option as he wished not to abandon his one and only son to a lifetime of torture on Apocalypse. While caring for his son was understandable, the source felt that High Father needed to better understand things. So it proceeded to literally strip High Father of most of his humanity, only wishing for it to work for the betterment of New Genesis and not for his own personal gains. However, that remnant of humanity wound up gaining his own sentience in the form of the Infinity Man. As High Father left to go participate in the exchange, the Infinity Man proclaimed that one day he would return and confront High Father and Darkseid for their actions. Now that the Infinity Man has returned, the time has come for the two aspects of Isaiah to reunite in battle. However, if it does happen, it probably won't happen with the Forever People, as Big Bear storms away, tired of being a pointless pawn in this never-ending battle. What happens next? Yeah. The series was cancelled before the next storyline could really take place, and whatever they were building to... Well, DC did a couple of events called Convergence and Rebirth after this that pretty much wiped out all but a few little bits of the New 52, so... That's pretty much it. So yeah, this concludes our look at Infinity Man and the Forever People from 2014. How was it? Well, I do think most of the artwork throughout this was pretty good. There's not really a lot of confusion. I'm pretty able, I'm pretty able to tell who's who. And again, oh, everyone looks fine. It looks perfectly decent. I do like a lot of the banter between the characters. There's some good humor in here. I do think the way the characters interact, the way you have Big Bear trying to teach the other people of New Genesis about life on Earth and how they function is some of the high points of this story. Unfortunately, the story itself is just kind of confusing, the way the characters act. I get the idea that they're kind of against the war, and so maybe they're trying to form this third entity that isn't at war with Apocalypse and, you know, just trying to live peacefully, but 
I don't get enough of that. Like, I don't know what Moonrider's motivations are. I don't, like, I get that this is what he wants, but I don't know why it is he wants this. And even then, it's like, I don't know why the others are with him. It sort of implied that he was maybe like the school heartthrob, and that's why Serafina and Dreamer are there. But again, I'm not entirely sure as to what's going on. Uh, the story itself kind of bounces around. Like, having that tie-in issue, like, I had to read it, but it didn't add anything. It just made it even more confusing. It, I don't even know where it was necessarily supposed to take place. Comicsology had it, like, fourth on the list, but I don't know if it was meant to be there, or maybe it was actually supposed to be after Moonrider initially died, and this is Dreamer reviving him with the anti-life equation. I, that probably made a bit more sense. And... Again, the cult and Infinity, it's just, it's so jumbled, it, it needed a creative focus behind it. And then maybe again to build to something, but it, like I said, doesn't really. And that's where, unfortunately, this falls apart, really. It's not terrible. It's not, you know, making me so worked up. I just, you know, hate it. I don't. I think it was, you know, all in a, a decent attempt, but it does not really follow through. I can't call this a total failure, but it does have to get a D. It's just not very good. If you're a huge fan of the New Gods, then probably just read the Kirby New Gods. That's probably the best way to get it. And with that, let's see what we're doing next time on the Random Trade Review. Hey guys, remember you can help support the channel at patreon.com forward slash sleepy time for cat productions. There you can request a tray to be put in the randomizer, aka the cardboard box. And as always, remember to like, comment, share, subscribe, and ring that notification bell.